This morning, uh, Pastor Tad is on vacation, and I am not him. I'm filling in. So if it's your first day here, I'm, the, I'm Isaac. Good morning. And being on call or on deck, as it would say, uh, I don't have the desire to go through the book of James and jump in the middle of his sermon. I know Tad wouldn't appreciate that anyways. So what I've been doing for a while is going through the book of 1 John. And that's what we're going to pick up today is in chapter 2. But it's been a little bit of time since I have picked up the, uh, this teaching. So just a little history of what's going on with this book and what, who is John writing to. He's writing this book to a group of believers who are in a state of confusion and doubt. The false teachings have begun to infiltrate this early church. And one of the, these false teachings was they were perpetrated by people that were from the fellowship at one time. And the claim that they're, they're talking about here is that Jesus, um, obviously these people had not seen Jesus. They, haven't, they weren't around when Jesus was alive. This is after the fact. This is the churches that the apostles went throughout and, and planted. They weren't there. They don't have firsthand uh, knowledge. They have the, the firsthand testimonies of John and other apostles and others who were there. So the teaching was that Jesus wasn't actually here in the flesh. He was a spirit, a spook, an apparition, and that he was immaterial, and he came down, and he was God, and he came down and did all these things. And, and that heresy was known as a docetism, and is one of the tenets of, of Gnosticism that's going to gain prominence later on. And it taught that the material world was evil, and the spirit was pure, and therefore Jesus never appeared in the flesh. So kind of uh, these teachings were, they're, they're going to be widespread, and the, disciples, the apostles are going to be, and Paul are going to be refuting them continuously. It's going to dog the church a bit for a while. So you see this group of people here who have John's teachings, who, who have been brought into this understanding of who Jesus was, into a saving knowledge of him, into a church. And they're, going, they're working this out. Like, what, what's going on with this falsehood? I mean, it's not like you can email John or go online and go to Blue Letter Bible and see what the great commentators say, right? They didn't have any of those tools. They had the, the pastors who planted the church. They had the teachings of the apostles, and it was all, you know, verbal. They didn't have a Bible. They may have had, they may have had some Old Testament scrolls. Who knows? So they're working this out. And they're, they need help, though, in restoring the truth and confidence they once had. So John's writing to this group of people that he often refers to as my little children. He cares about them deeply. He's, his heart is for them. He has the heart of a shepherd for them. He desires to see them corrected and not go off on tangents. Because you know what? When, you're, when, you're, when your faith is shaken, when you struggle with doubt, you leave the joy of the Lord. You, you, you are shaken to the very core of your beliefs. Do I really believe that? Was everything John said false? What, you know, this other influence that's gaining ground in their lives, you know, what do you do about that? So in, in the book of, book of 1 John, chapter 1, he starts to write out and explain to them. I'm not going to go back there. You can look if you'd like. Certainly, that would be great. But John starts talking to them about the firsthand knowledge of his testimony. So he's refuting this claim that Jesus was immaterial. He says that um, he heard from Jesus, he saw Jesus, he perceived, and he tangibly touched Jesus. These are the things that we share about him. The eternal Jesus who was from the beginning, he was this eternal God who came in the flesh, living human being. John declares this and, and is reinforcing the gospel that was already planted in their hearts, the faith that was already there. He's working to rebuild them. Remember where we're from. Remember what started this whole thing. And this is the truth because you can trust me. You do trust me. In a sense, I'm your spiritual father. So you're going you're gonna to trust what I saw, what others saw. And not just him. There's other people. He wants to call in reinforcements. There's others who saw the, Jesus and met him and, and, and were taught by him. So here he is. He's saying, look, this is the truth. And that... The truth is that God desires fellowship with his people. He desires a people to be called his own, and he's calling them out of the world. And fellowship with God and his son Jesus is available to all who believe. 
That's the truth of the gospel. That's, right. That's what Jesus came for. That's what God did this whole thing, was to restore that fellowship he had with man, who we created for fellowship, companionship. It was destroyed by sin because sin separates the holiness of God. It's unrighteous, it's darkness. And John even says, God is light, man. In him is no darkness. He starts to address the issues that separate us. Sin is a big, important thing. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Peter is talking about this to others as well. Like As we talked about, these other church members had never seen Jesus. And this is not an uncommon thing. And the fact that they hadn't seen him didn't make him any less real. Right? And they were experiencing this Jesus. First Peter 1 Peter 1.8, it says, having, Whom, having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible. It was a reality for that early church to have this relationship with Jesus who they never met, and it's a reality for us today. It's something that we, struggle, we could struggle with the same dynamic as well. And it's a little different because we don't have John who had firsthand knowledge. So for us today, as we're looking back at this, we have to look at what the history tells us about the scripture, the, the validity, the reliability of the scriptures. And we can take confidence in all those things. And if anybody has any questions about that, I'm not, this is not necessarily a sermon on that information, but I, we can provide it for you. Definitely, we can help you with that if that's something you're struggling with. There's, there's all kinds of documentation in history, literature. I mean, you just go through. It, it's amazing how much proof text there are, more so than other writings of antiquity. It's reliable. And God is the one who sustained his word because this is the foundation of his church here, of his body here on earth. This was important. This is where we get doctrine. This is where we get our wisdom from. This is how we relate to God we, through his word. God uses that vehicle to, to speak into the lives of people and change them. So John, having now he's dealt with this falsehood, he, he seeks to encourage his readers now. Go on to living a life that is free from sin. He talked about the dangers of sin and how that if you go to God, he will cleanse you and you, and you confess your sins. God ha, is not unaware that you're going to sin, that you're going to fail. He's talking about a lifestyle of sin. A lifestyle of sin is a lifestyle of rebellion. And that has no place in God's kingdom. If you say you're a follower of Jesus, you don't live contrary to his nature. We're being transformed. There should be transformation that we see in the lives of believers. Sin is dangerous, and if left undealt with, it's going to work to undo everything God is trying to do in your life. Everything he has done it's going to weed its way around, and it's going to pervert things. It's going to destroy what you once had confidence in. It's going to leave you alone. It, it, it wants you to be cut off from the other believers as well. You're not going to want to fellowship. You're not going to want to be in Bible study. You're not going to want to be around other things that remind you of your sin. And that's what it's going to do from us. It's going to cut us off from God's influence and power, and that's, that cannot happen. This is so important. So John's saying, look, this is the important part. Even where you're at right now, God still wants to help you. He says, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, if you want to turn there. He says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. What do you think about that? Does that sound like a bold statement? Yes. Does it sound like John is, well, think of, I'm, I'm being cynical a little bit. Does it sound like John's just cheerleading and that's just a, a cute catchphrase, like what would Jesus do or something? In our world, do, do we really believe that, that we can live a life without sin? Is that a reality? Is that, is that something that you are aware of? Or have you consigned yourself to living a life that struggles and deals with sin all the time and just something I got to do? And maybe we go off the reservation for a while, then we come back and it's, we never really grow. There's no depth to us. It's not impossible with God. Amen. It's not. Nothing is. It's his power. He's the one doing the work. It's not by our will or our strength that we go, I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm just going to stop right now. I'm done. Right? We don't do that because we're sinning already because we have pride. We think we can do more than God. So, and we lie. 
We lie to ourselves. Don't lie to yourself. Be honest. In our day, I think there's so many different distractions in this world. There's so many. I, I look upon what my sons are and daughters are going to have to go through in this world, and I kind of com try to compare that to the 80s when I grew up. So long ago. The beautiful colors. Uh, but um, the fashion. It's coming back, by the way. But I think about what I was dealing with in high school and, and growing up, and I'm, I'm like, I can't believe what my kids are going to have to contend with. The access to um, the media that doesn't glorify God, that is, it's from the pit of hell. You know, it, it's ruined so many lives. It, it does. And not only that, video games, man, Fortnite, man, geez. It's, it's ridiculous. They get so mesmerized by the screen, it, it messes them up emotionally. And we see the effects of it. And I just realities I never even thought of. I never had a video game. I had like Atari with a weird joystick thing. I had it like 10 years after it was like out, you know. So I was like one of the last guys to have it. Everybody else had something else. No, but with all those things, it's, it's the reality of living a sinless life could seem impossible. It could seem like it's just such a far ago, that's an old-fashioned statement. And of course they could talk about living a sinless life because they had nothing. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have, you know, clubs and parties. They were in the, the pit, man. They were in areas that there was all kinds of impurities happening. And we can't sugarcoat what, what that early church was dealing with. Paganism, running free, running wild. The government suppressing, killing the people. Outlawing who they were. Now, they had it just as hard as us. We, we can't say that our, our life is any worse. We have more amenities and more riches than they could have ever thought of. Look what we get to do. We get to meet in a church building. They had to meet in houses in secret at times. We get to proclaim the gospel freely. That's the truth that we can, we should relish in this. this is, we're very blessed to be living in this time. See, but God doesn't treat this fact that way, that statement. He doesn't scoff at live holy. He's like, no, that's pretty much what I say to you. Leviticus 20, chapter 20, verse 7 says, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. He's like, be holy because I'm holy. You claim to live in me. Be holy and walk after me. These are, you must reflect who I am. And when we don't represent God correctly, he's going to bring some discipline into our life and correction and sometimes he's going to allow sin to work itself out to where we finally start to look up and we're, we're humbled before him. And we desire his strength, his influence in our life. The bar wasn't lowered then, and it shouldn't be lowered for us today. We should seek the high calling of God. We should seek difficult things. We should shoot for perfection and holiness. What if we did that? What if we really did that in every part of our life? What would, what would we look like? Is that a, a length that we're not willing to go? It's a question we all have to ask ourselves. What am I willing to do for this? Gentlemen, what are you prepared to do? From Apollo 13. I love that line. Tom Hanks. Gentlemen, what are you prepared to do? Because I want to go home. You know, that should be our attitude as well. What are we prepared to do? We want to go home. This, isn't, this world is not our home. We're pilgrims, we're, we're sojourners through this world. We need to be living like our house is not in Ellensburg, it's in heaven. I'm working to, towards that. I'm working towards that reality. We have to get out of the mundane, the temporal, the things that, that distract us and start to be heavenly minded. Thinking about a land that's coming for us, what, what God's going to bring into our life. You know, and I say these things not because I've attained nirvana or perfection or something weird like that. And I'm better than anybody. I'm a sinner. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not perfect. I struggle. I have doubts, too. I, I go through the whole gamut myself. And I, I'm not arrived. And please don't ever think that that's true. God reveals this truth first to me to deliver here today. The reality is I need God. I need to aim for perfection. I need it to permeate my life. I need it to be the goal. Because the reality is, is that there's more working for us to achieve that goal than there is working against us. 
we have God is for us who can be against us. The, you have the resources of the Holy Spirit. Now, the first church had those same resources, and, and, and John's bringing them back to that. Man, the next statement is going to be huge. He points them to this truth. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. See, Jesus wasn't just an immaterial being. Now, Casper, he's not concerned with what we're going through. He's just being Casper, the friendly ghost, right? He's running around doing something and haunting people or whatever he does and wants to be like a regular boy. He's not it's sad. You know, but he's not concerned with what's happening today. He's not, he's not engaged with, with true life. And that's what the, this, this false teachings were saying. Jesus doesn't care about you, man. He's floating off in, you know, somewhere near Saturn or something, creating something. He doesn't care about what you're dealing with here in this church, what we're struggling with daily. He's, he's left us because we're, not, we're below him. We're not spiritual. We're not pure. The truth is that Jesus is engaged with this, with this church. He's actively working for them. He's supporting the readers in, in, their, in their weaknesses and in their trials. Through this time, he's there with them. He's, he's bringing John and bringing this word to encourage them to move them forward to perfection. And his ministry is the same today, and it's just as vital today for us that Jesus loves you. Jesus, when you're sinning, Jesus is supporting you in heaven. He's between your sin and God. That's his place. That's his job. He's there to pray for you. Isn't that pretty cool? I think it's cool. And he's the perfect one to speak out in our defense. What does the angel know about struggling with sin? Well, how can they relate to us? They can't. They don't understand what we're going through. Jesus understands the human condition perfectly. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16 says here seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need we are so blessed. Amen. The early church was so blessed. This was good news for them. It was refreshing. It was water to their soul, a thirsty soul. Getting back focused, yes, it's about Jesus. Yes, I need to re remember what this is all about. He is alive. He said he was coming back. He said he was going to intercede for me. These are everything that John confirmed. He was there with him. He saw the miracles. He saw raising people from the dead. He saw him ascend to heaven. He saw all these things. Yes, it's true. It's something I can build my life upon. And it's something that's going to get me through this current moment of doubt and being shaken. It's going to put my feet back on the firm foundation. And it's going to move me forward. Jesus advocating for me, <laughs> helping us, supporting us, you know, helping me daily. We have so much to celebrate. And this was the gospel. This was the good news, that Jesus wasn't dead. He's alive. He's in heaven doing what he said he was going to do. Not only that, in verse 2 of chapter 2, he says, And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the whole world. We can read this, and it, we just kind of read over it at times. And just kind of go, yeah, I know. I read that in Sunday school. I made a picture out of it or something, the verse. We can get sanitized to this truth. But Jesus, the truth is Jesus freely offered himself to satisfy the righteous judgment of God. Every sin you've done, every sin I've done, the whole world has done, the most insidious things. Jesus said, I got that. Yes, that's filthy and ugly and vulgar and repulsive. I got it. Voluntarily, he did that. It was own free will. He saw us in our worst condition. When you think of the worst atrocities in, that, that have happened in history, Jesus died for those people. He made a provision for them. 
an atonement for their sin. He paid that debt they couldn't pay. For the wages of sin is death, and, and judgment had to be satisfied. God's holy. He's righteous. That had to be done. It wasn't like God turns his eye from it. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, we are forgiven. Forgiveness came at a cost. Actually, this isn't forgiveness. This is the, it's the payment of it. You still need to accept this. We still need to accept this truth that Jesus died for us. We need to live that in our reality, in our life, and make him Lord of our life. And unfortunately, even though he died for everybody and made this atonement, not everyone gets saved. Not everyone's going to be in heaven. Not everyone's going to be a partaker of this truth. Some will reject it. Some won't let it go deep enough. And we can't be like that. We have to be in desperation for this because nothing else works in life. We try so many things. Remember where you were before you came to Christ, some of us. What we struggle with, depression, all kinds of things. Anger, jealousy, a slave to the gym. You know, I need to look like so-and-so because everybody else looks like them and you know, I don't have that body or I'm not perfect. And I, what happens from that? Because we don't match up to other people. It's horrible living without hope. It's horrible living without Jesus. There's no hope there. There's, there's no, and there's nothing to expect out of this world. And if the false teachers were right, then there was no hope at all. If he was just a spirit, then... The sacrifice didn't count. Sometimes we need, you need to apply reason to falsehoods. Not sometimes, I say all the time. Reason through the scripture. The scriptures are useful. and They're beneficial to us. That's why God says, know my word, live it, study it. It's not because he's the eternal school teacher and saying, what's that verse? And you're like, uh... I didn't say it right. Slap. He doesn't, that's not what it's about. <laughs> it's for our benefit. Now, in Hebrew, we're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. Because Paul talks about this. What, what if it was, what, it is true that Jesus wasn't, in fact, human or something? What does that do? Paul says, For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. That's us. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, like he might be, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. There it is. He had to be made like his brethren. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. The reality is only Jesus was the one who could do this work. He came as a man, lived a sinless life, fulfilled the law, and was the perfect sacrifice that, God, that, would, that would satisfy God's righteous judgment to take our place. These believers could look back on those things and say, you know what, that, then why do they keep talking about Jesus as a spirit? Then if he was not really human, then he had no real ministry here at all. And it's all, it's all for nothing it doesn't make sense. It doesn't hold up. The falsehood doesn't hold up to the totality of Scripture, to what they knew. I love that. You start to engage your mind in things, spiritual things. You can do this. God's given you guys, given us all incredible truth to anchor our lives on, to hold us fast. In verse 3 of, back in 1 John chapter 2, he says, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are, we are in him. He includes us in here so that they can have confidence in their new life in Christ. provides evidence that God is at work in your life. You know, maybe, maybe some of these people didn't see that evidence. Maybe they it got, kind of got lost in the shuffle of things. Maybe you don't see that evidence in your life. We look close enough 
you can see it. Dib Guzik says in his commentary, we have a gracious advocate in heaven. We have an open invitation to restoration through confession. Yet these things do not make the converted man careless about the commandments. God changes the heart at conversion and writes his law upon our heart. There's real change that happens inside of you guys and me and all believers. And you know, it's not an emotional thing. When my mom, the day she told, she always told me this when she was a kid, the day she got saved in church, she turned around and looked and saw everybody in white robes. And I'm like, oh, that didn't happen to me. <laughs> they all look the same. <laughs> and I didn't, you know, I was emotional the day I got saved, but not everybody is. You don't feel like, oh, I'm being transformed. You know, you don't go through this, you know, come out of your cocoon or something. Look, I have wings. You don't necessarily have those feelings because it's not about emotions. It's about the truth of the reality of what God's doing. And it's great when that is a part of it. It's, it's amazing. It's something you'll never forget. Or feeling the weight of sin pulled off your back. Those are, those are gifts that God gives us to, to see that and to visualize it. But the reality of God's changing us from darkness to light, from death to life, our desires, our motives, our interests, they should all start to be redirected from being controlled and influenced by sin to now freedom to be righteous. We're no longer slaves to sin. That's a good song, right? I'm a child of God. Think about the words of that song. It's so powerful. And I don't know all the words, so I'm not going to try it right now, but the reality of those things, God is for us. He's making the way for us of freedom. He's like saying, follow me. I'm going to lead you to bigger and greater things in me, more than you could have imagined. Can the world see a difference in you? Can you? Maybe you struggle with this doubt. But God frees us from it. And don't allow that to bring you back into bondage. And maybe you're beating yourself over sin, of things you've done, you've hurt people, who knows where you could be at right now. Remember, the enemy wants to divide and push us away from God. God's calling us unto himself. He has provisions for that. He wants to help you. If we look close enough, you can start to see the proof in your life. You weren't the same person you were when you got saved. If you got saved last week, you may still be the same person working on it. It's okay. That's all right. It's all right. We're moving in the right directions. I, I, get, I think there is something happening in you, and you can, you can see it. You can realize it. Look close. Just as there is evidence of God's work uh, for us to see, vice versa, is the truth as well. If you're not following God, you're going to be all messed up. You're going to see evidence of, of rebellion. You're going to see evidence of depravity. Things that lead you away from God that are not holy. You're going to, it's going to be written all over your life. It's important to examine our hearts daily. It's important for us to come before the God, for God, to God, honestly, where we're at in our imperfection. You know what? And, and not even to lie to each other. God says there's healing that happens. There's blessing for you when you confess your sins one to another. You know, don't let the tradition, the tradition of church in America keep you from a real relationship with God and with his people. It's not what this is about. We're all messed up. God's work of sanctification moves us toward perfection. It's his work, and our responsibility is obedience to his commands. Verse 6 of chapter 2 says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. Another version says, Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. I think it's the NIV. I always like that, that better. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. If we're claiming, you know, you can see them around, the, the, the people, the false teachers, they were claiming to be in Jesus, but they weren't of him. They weren't speaking the truth. They weren't talking about God's plan. They were talking about some other falsehood, breeding dissension. They're sheep, wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> say that one right. 
You can tell. Now, as we abide in him, abiding is, is, a, is a good Christian word. What does that mean? Abiding in Christ means allowing his word to fill our minds, direct our wills, and transform our affections. Pretty simple. Jesus says, abide in me. I like that. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's crazy, you know, that God gives us everything we need to live a godly life. And he says, you know what, if you're struggling with this, I'm going to give you everything. Yeah, if you, sometimes you don't want to do it, pray, and I'm going, to, I'm going to help you through that. The advocate is always supporting us, is always there on our side. And I will say that John here is building up something that will last with this group of readers. And it did. We can see the impact of the, the first church. They changed the world. They spread the gospel. Because of them, we're here today. Because of that, we understand the word of God. We have fellowship with one another. We understand what... Think about this system of belief. How it survived the ages. How it survived being hunted down and destroyed. God's word remains true. His, it, it, faithful to it. It's lasted the test of time. It's nothing else like it on this earth because it's from God. And God protects his work. God's there all around it. He's not going to let it fail. And these same truths hold the same power and wisdom for us today if we access the throne of God, the grace of God. Number one, Jesus is here for us. He's advocating for us daily. We're not alone in this world. It's not just us and Facebook <laughs> and crazy people. You know, and uh, once again, I'll just encourage you to unplug from that garbage. Right. You notice, one thing I noticed, and this came as a late thought in the process, but John's addressing specific things. He's not addressing the conditions of the world around this church. The political movements, the things happening in the pagan world. He's not saying, watch out for those things. Oh, that's a given. But it shouldn't have an influence in their life. They should have their head down, focused on one thing. That's living for God. And that's a good word for us today, too. Unplug from that stuff. Open the book. Open God's word. Let it dispel all the, all the craziness that's out there because it's nonsense. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? And that's the reality we live in today. And today, he is the answer for the sin issue in our lives. He is. It's not trying harder. It's not doing better. It's not, I'm in five accountability groups, and then I do another counseling session twice a week, and then I do this thing, and I go to every Bible study, Please, those are all great things, but it's not that. It's, it's the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life and of Jesus and, and all the resources of heaven helping you, sustaining you to live a, a godly life. God's the only one you need. That's the truth. He's the only one you need. If, if all of us were gone and you just had God, you have everything. You're not at a loss. If we're struggling, don't condemn yourself. Because the truth is, it's just you and Satan doing that. <laughs> God is forgiving you. He's provided provisions, abundant provisions of grace to cover your sin. Now, I'm not talking about a lifestyle of sin. Like Isaac said, I can go party and do all kinds of stuff, and God's going to forgive me. That's a misunderstanding of God's grace. And you may not be saved if that's the way you live life. You have to reexamine yourself in that. That's not what he's saying at all. Grace came at a price. Let's not cheapen it. God looks at you as his child. He doesn't look at you through eyes of wrath. It's love and acceptance because of what Jesus did. And he desires to cleanse you. He has good intentions towards you and towards me. He wants us to be built up. Do you want your... I'm trying not to raise kids that are brats. I'm not sure about everybody else, but that's me. Uh, my kids whine and moan about a bunch of stuff, and I can't stand it. I'm like, you guys got to break out of that. This is not okay. You can't grow up like that. I'm determined not to do that. 
Now, God doesn't want to raise a bunch of brats either. Healthy kids is what he's trying to do. Isn't that what we want for our kids, to have it better than us, to learn from our mistakes, to not have to go over the ground that we did? Man, God's desire for, our, for us as his children is greater than that. And not only that, he has the power to change us. Oh, I wish I could change my kids sometimes. <laughs> I don't get it. I wish I could go into their minds and argue, don't do that. But I can't. But God can. God can. The third thing is we can have confidence in our new life. We can have confidence as believers today. Acknowledge the evidence of a transformed heart. Look into your life intently. You'll see the, the fingerprints of God. You'll see evidence of God. And if you don't, maybe you need to reassess your commitment to God. Maybe you didn't really understand it. Maybe it was just an emotional thing. Maybe you never let it really take root. God gives us this time to, of self-reflection. He wants us to be honest. He wants us to see where we're at. Because from there, when we acknowledge the truth about God, we, we're in agreement with what the Lord says about our life, and we're willing to change, we can. The Lord is faithful in that. And if you have a little faith, that's all right. Ask God for more. Strengthen what you do have. Get yourself up off the ground. Don't keep going back. You might have sinned 100 times this week. Get up every single time. Seek help. Ask others to come alongside you. God's given you resources here in this world as well. And the last thing is to walk in Jesus. He's our example. And he's, he was faithful in all things. He submitted to the Father. He had close communion with God. And he prayed often. That's what Jesus did. If we claim to live in him, we must walk as he did. That's the example. That's the template for our life. When it's like... We need to be a Christian. What does that look like? Well, look at Jesus. And realize that God's work of sanctification, of, of cleaning us up, of changing us, is to transform us into Jesus Christ. He's the benchmark. Nobody sitting next to you or in front of you is, is that person you need to compare yourself to. It's Jesus only. Don't strive to be like others. Strive to be like Christ. And you'll never go wrong. <laughs> Once again, abiding in Christ means allowing his word to fill our minds, direct our wills, and transform our affections. And I just want to encourage you to give Jesus the freedom to influence your life. 